everyone, I'm Vivian. Um, welcome to my channel. Today, I'm gonna introduce a city called Tianjin City. So here we go. Um, okay. So um, Tianjin is one of China's four municipalities under the direct administration of the central government. It is an international port city and the largest seaside city in the north of China, 137 kilometers away from Beijing, the capital of China. Tianjin is a well-known city with a long history and abundant resources. The name of Tianjin, meaning the emperor's port, came into being in the Ming Dynasty. The area of Tianjin first appeared in historical documents in the Tang Dynasty as Sanhui Haikou. This literally means estuary of three rivers. Adjacent to the same rivers, Tianjin enjoys distinct geographical advantages. After the opening of the Beijing Hangzhou Grand Canal in the Sui Dynasty, which is in um, around 581 to 681, Tianjin became an important node transportation. It has played a significant role in the economic uh, exchanges and development between the north and south of China. In the first half of the 20th century, Tianjin developed into a center of foreign trade, industry, and finance in northern China, the second largest industrial and commercial city in modern China, and an economic center in northern China. Thanks to the economic radiation and impact of Tianjin, unprecedented uh, progress was made in the modernization and open up of various industries in northern China, which greatly improved the overall uh, economic strength of the northern China and stopped the downward trend of the economic status of the northern region in the country at the time making this place once again one of the regions with with a high level of economic development in the country now i'm going to introduce the tourist attractions in Tianjin. first uh i want to introduce huangyaguan great wall it is considered to be a miniature of the great wall of china uh, in the section, you can find the stone base built in the Northern Qi Dynasty and the brick battlements laid in the Ming Dynasty. Watchtowers there are either solid or hollow and have different shapes, including round ones and square ones. Outside, you may see an um, independent outpost of uh, a few meters away from each other. Inside, there are also ramparts to reinforce the defense system. Surrounded by abrupt mountains, Huangya Pass is one of the most important passes with barbicans, turrets, implements, barracks, and other indispensable military facilities already arranged. Within the pass, more than 40 crisscrossing streets from the sh form the shape of the eight diagram which gave the pass a nickname, 8 Diagram Fortification City. In the center of the 8 Diagram Street um, is the Huangyaguan Great War Museum, which used to be the dispatcher's office in the Ming Dynasty. Here you can have a look of the weapons and daily necessities used, in, used by soldiers in the Ming Dynasty. Besides the constructional sites, you can also feel the cultural atmos atmosphere by viewing poems in inscribed in the steel forest and 
couplets carved on the bamboo strips in the couplet hall. And importantly, it was listed as World Cultural Heritage as UN uh, by UNESCO in 1987. The next attraction is Tianjin Ai, uh, also known as, as the Tianjin uh, Tian Ai is a ferris wheel as tall as 120 meters. Completed in 2008, the huge wheel is one of the handful of towering Chinese observation wheels. The giant attraction features almost 50 passengers' compartments that can fit eight people at a time, spinning the little nose around 400 feet above the Russian waters of the high. The wheel is supported by tripronch struts that can be attached to the Yongle Bridge underneath the wheel. Uh, during the daytime, the wheel has an almost industrial feel to its dark white steel construction. But by night, the permit of the ride lights up the in a colorful neon display that can be seen all across the city. The reflection of the wheel in the river just serves to make the display doubly impressive. At its maximum capacity, the Tianjin Icon holds almost 800 riders an hour, making it almost an, uh, as efficient as ferrying people at the commuter bridge beneath it. Drivers on the Ryuna Bridge can wave to the people riding overhead, and unlike anywhere else in the world, the riders on the wheel can wave at the boats traveling on the river. Uh, the next is Ancient Cultural Street, uh, also known as Gu Wenhua Jin Chinese. It's located in the Nankai district of Tianjin city and it was for, formally opened in 1986. It is uh, located on the west bank of the Haihe River um, with the Temple of the Queen of Heaven as its geographical center. Ancient Cultural Street begins from Gongbei Avenue in the north and ends at Gongnan Avenue in the south. Being 750 yards long and 16 feet wide. Although essentially a business street, it attracts visitors who came to see special architecture styles, admire its classic, classical um, culture features by various folk crafts, and sample, sample the delicious local snacks. Above all, as visitors take a walk here, they will be particularly impressed by the splendid replica classical architecture in the folk style of the Qing Dynasty. This, uh, especially visitors who are interested in Chinese traditional handcraft appreciate highlight of the ancient Chinese tree. The hundreds of stores selling a wide variety of folk handicrafts. This includes the famous Yang Liu Qi New Year paintings and Nei Ren Zhang painting sculptures. Visitors who are fond of Chinese curios such as jade items, pottery, will also be able to find many examples of space for sale here. The street is also a favorite place to sample delicious local snacks. The local delicacies uh, include Gobli, steamed dumplings, adoye, fried cakes, and tea soup. Um, if Ching Tom's is the last, but it's the ex existing largest and most intact student imperial tombs in China, with altogether 15 tombs containing the, men, uh, the remains of emperor empresses, concubines, and princesses of Qing Dynasty. Occupying an area of 200 square kilometers, Tomsi is 125 kilometers in length, uh, 20 kilometers in width, 
and both two mountains standing opposite each other in the south direction. Surrounded by mountains with a uh, mouth only in 15 meter wide, uh, the grand architecture complex owns over 580 monomer construction, 217 arcways, uh, including a, an existing widest one in China, and an intact and well preserved sacred way over 6,000 meters, along which connects the southmost archway uh, with the central tomb of Emperor Shen Shenzhi, the Shao tomb in the north. 15 tombs in East Qing tombs were arranged according to the Chinese traditional concept. A center for honor, respect for seniority or private priority in rank. The tomb of the first emperor of Qin Dynasty, Shenzhi Emperor, was uh, built exactly on the exile wall, which enjoyed the most revered and respected statue. On the left next to it, it is the tomb for its his son, Emperor Kangxi, the right for his great grandson, Emperor Qianlong, and the rest were was done in the same manner. Meanwhile, tombs for empresses and concubines were just built around the tomb of their respective husbands. In addition, the sacred way of tomb for empresses was connected with that for his husband and the sacred ways of all, all tombs for emperors were connected with that for the first Emperor Shenzhi. As a matter of fact, it's Qing tombs is grand up, but clear cut showing the family interrelationship. And here we go, the five avenues, which is kind of my favorite. I love the buildings there, so I'm gonna introduce this place for you. Uh, it is a major Tianjin attraction that is located in the south of downtown Tianjin, a parallel street from east to west named under five cities of south and west China, named Chongqing, Changde, da, Dali, Munan, and Machang. Tianjin lo locals call it the Five Avenues, together with over 230 buildings of various architectural styles in Britain, France, Italy, Germany, and Spain, as well as over 50 houses ever lived by uh, celebrities. Architecture styles range from the Renaissance, Greek, Gothic, Romantic, Eclectic, and Carson, which constitute a true form of art. On both sides of Munan Street, there are row upon row of Western buildings Mutual beautiful courtyards and gardens, which fully show the European style. Dali Street, formerly known as Singapore Street, is famous for the single Western style, building styles of various European styles. In the Chongqing Street, most of the buildings are high class row apartments, among which there are many former residences of celebrities including the only palace of Tianjin Qing Dynasty, Tianjin Qing Palace. Located at the most northern part, Chengdu Street has become a main welcome route of Tianjin. As a national level historical and cultural city, Tianjin attracts attract attach, attract a lot of visitors and attaches great importance to the protection of historical buildings. Based on domestic and international experience of historical buildings protection, um, the actual situation in Tianjin, the Tianjin ha, uh, those buildings in Tianjin have made it comprehensive refurbishment on the Five Avenue historical building area and makes it an important window of Tianjin. Uh, the last a uh, tourist attraction I'm going to introduce to you guys is Hosinan House. Located on the Chifeng Road of the Heping District in Tianjin, the Hosinan House uh, is a French-style building and 
embellished by person name. Uh, standing by before the house, tourists will be amazed by the colorful china well com uh, cemented onto the wall. The windows, doors, pillars, eaves, and roofs are all ex ex exquisite, decorated with different china wells. Moreover, tourists will find beautiful porcelain decorations on the handrails, ceilings, and walls inside the house. The house is so extraordinary that it has no parallel in the world. On the roof of the building circles a gigantic, gigantic dragon adorned by China Well with a length of 840 yards and a width of 0.8 meters. Even the drain pipes outside of the house are ambitious with crystal and cat shaped porcelain pillows. Inside the building, the ceilings and handrails hand are decorated with China well too. The house preserves hundreds of previous furniture from Ming Dynasty and Qing Dynasty, and more than 200 calligraphs and paintings, both from home and abroad, including the masterpieces of Chinese great masters Zhang Shen, Qi Bai Shi, and Xu Bei Hong, and foreign masters Van Gogh and Picasso. All of the precious treasures in China makes the house inestimable and splendid. Furthermore, the house combines traditional elements with Chinese culture. The outside of the wall is decorated by vases, and they are called walls of peace. Similarly, white marble sculptures and rock images are used frequently to symbolize good luck and chance. At last, the vivid dragons and phoenixes on the eve symbolize prosperity and peace. And then it's our food introduction time. Then I'm gonna introduce six famous dishes in Tianjin to all of you. Let's take a look at the last picture. Uh, there are three Chinese words written called gou bu li. So this is the most famous um, dishes in Tianjin, called Gobuli Sim Dumpling, also known as Gobuli Baozi. It is Tianjin's premier homegrown home snack. Back to perfection, these steamed buns can be stuffed with meat or vegetables and uh, are cleaner, so called version of dumplings with less oil and more filling. Gobuli was created during the Qin Dynasty by a small town native named Dogi, who named who, who came to Tianjin and apprenticed um, in a restaurant that specialized in baking stuff buns. So much that eventually he and his recipe um, became famous national wide. Dogi was given the nickname Gobuli by his customers. It means Dogi doesn't talk because he was too occupied making buns to talk to them in the restaurant. The Gobli Bun Shop stands today as a corporation with nearly 90 branches in Tianjin and more than more, more throughout in China. Uh, try as many as Try as many buns as you can. There are over 90 varieties and over 200 dishes in Gobli's restaurant. And the right picture is called Ear Hole Fried Cake. It's also a fam famous dish in Tianjin. It actually has nothing to do with the ear holes, nor does it look like one. Introduced over eight, 80 years ago by peddler Liu Wanchun, who walked with a wheelbarrow full of these cakes along Tianjin's Bai Da Gua, a narrow street that resemble an ear hole. The cakes started gaining notoriety on the streets, and Liu opened his own shop. Made with rice dough and red beans filling, when finished, the petrol has a golden color and is crunchy on the outside, while sweet and tender 
within. Uh, let's take a look at the last picture. It's kind of my favorite snack in Tianjin. It's called fried dough cheese. It, lo it looks like um, a little complicated to make, and they are. These not these knotty shaped patches are made of, are made with flour and peanut oil and a pound with um waxy paste made of beans. This crispy specialty snack stays fresh for a few months, so you can take some home and share a taste of changing. It's really crispy, and you need to bite it carefully. Or you might, you know, hurt your teeth or something. But it's really like the best snack I ever tasted in Tianjin. And the right picture is called Jianbing. Uh, it's kind of my second favorite. This breakfast creek, which can now be found all over the world, was originally invented in Tianjin. A batter made with moonbeam flour and sometimes wheat. It's spread across a cast iron pan and cooked with the precise circular movements with the spatula. The cooked uh, crepe is then brushed with a silver bean paste. After that, vendors will either stuff a fried dough stick or a fried dough crisp known as bao cui for texture of lay. During entrepreneurs uh, have tried stuffing other things into jam, including smashed avocado sauce or pork, beef, lettuce, as you can see from the picture. It, it, it is filled with a couple of things. I can tell there there's like uh, egg, lettuce, um, uh, fried dough crisp, and probably some meat. And now the last is called Ba Da Wa, their Chinese name. English name is Eight Great Bowls. As you can see, there are eight great bowls. It is one of the most famous dishes in Tianjin. It is a combination of eight many meat dishes. It can be further classified into several varieties, including the rough, smooth, and high. The thing eight Large bowls include quick fried fish fillet, braised and shelled fresh shrimp, fresh cocktail, sweet scented asmanta fish bones, braised butterfish, Sichuan swish, Sichuan thrashed meat, Sichuan large meatballs, roast meat, and so on. The thick eight, eight large bowls consists of fried blue shelled fresh shrimp, boiled shred shredded chicken, mixed and cooked egg soup, and crab overall. Trap and meatball, civil, piece meat, consumed chicken, uh, braised chicken, daily family cooked crab, carp, and so on. The eight large bowls are often served at banquet. The right picture is called Guo Ba Cai. This snack favorite is made of Kale, those go of a, of some specific local ingredients. Guobata starts out as pancakes made of grain and bean flour before being sliced into lingerie like noodles. Then they are cooked in a sauce made up of sashimi oil, ginger, soy sauce, green onions, and bean curds. They are best served alongside other changing snacks and make an excellent breakfast. And last, I'm gonna introduce the super cultural thing, Tianjin Crosstalk. Crosstalk is a folklore performance with a long history, vast spreading area, and a profound mass basis. Although the founding father worshipped by crosstalk entertainers is Dong Fang Shuo, an inter 
intelligent in the Han Dynasty. It was actually formed and developed in the Qing Dynasty. In early years, entertainers who made contributions to the formation and development of crosstalk, including Chong Chong Bu Pa, Wen Renmin, and the Nidi Nidashi, who gave performance in Tian Chao in Beijing. They created quite a few new stories in their performance, which enriched the content crosstalk. Though crosstalk originated in Beijing, Tianjin, as a poor city, has become a must for crosstalk entertainers because of proximity to Beijing, which gradually led to the situation that entertainers could perform in Beijing only after they had been recognized by Tianjin audience. Many well-known crosstalk entertainers have been performing in Tianjin for years before they uh, went to perform all over the country. Um, Ho Bai Lin, Ho Bao Lin, Zhang Shuochen, and Guo, Mei, Guo Rongqi were no exception. Ma San Li, who enjoys the highest prestige in the circle of crosstalk today, also, become, also became famous in Tianjin. Besides, there are uh, Chang Lian, Chang Bao Kun, Bai Quan Fu, Su Wen Mao, Gao Yingpei, Fan Zhen Yu, and so on. Tianjin functions as a cradle for the upspring and development of crosstalk, so it is not its hometown. Tianjin people are fond of crosstalk for, for it gives them more happiness and laughter. Later, I will show you guys some videos about Tianjin crosstalk. So uh, that's my pre presentation today. And now I'm gonna share some videos with you guys about how Tianjin looks and uh, the vivid introduction of Tianjin food and um, the crosstalk in Tianjin. So here we go. I'm gonna share the video of Tianjin City first, so that you can have a, um, you can have a, you know, basic impression of how Tianjin looks. So, uh, here we go. All you need to launch a cult skate brand. Honestly, as long as you have a logo that looks good on literally everything, and a Squarespace
Okay, so now I'm gonna share uh, another video of uh, the food hunt uh, in Kenji. Here we go. Tianjin is often called the street food capital of northern China, and it's easy to see why. Located just an hour outside Beijing, this port city has a long history of trade. And with booming business came vendors and their street food. Tianjin is known for its carb-heavy comfort foods like pancakes and buns. They're made with wheat and mung bean, two major crops in this part of China. Here are our favorite street snacks you'll want to try. Gaohuli. This steamed pork bun is one of the city's most famous snacks and it started appearing on the streets in the 1850s. Being. This breakfast crepe, which can now be found all over the world, was originally invented in Tianjin. Guobatai. This thick, gravy-like soup has noodles inside made from mung bean flour. Sugar balloon. Candy is universal, but these sugar artists take it to the next level. Dough sticks can be found all over China, but they're especially huge in Tianjin. You can find these five foods here at this location. And as always, feel free to taste around. In our next episode, we roam across Hong Kong to try the five most iconic snacks in the city that never slows down. And if you missed our last episode about street eats in this water town, be sure to hit the links below. Until next time, happy eating wherever you are. So, uh, how do you like the videos? I'm gonna introduce you, you guys to the cross talk as well. I can't find the uh, the video, the cross talk video in Tianjin with English, English subtitles. So, um, let's introduce to the cross talk. Similar to the Abbott Costello style. Let's take a look. My phone, phone, my three hot phone. Now you're drunk. Lala, Lia, Jay, we got Nebu Fine. Some die, Sugar, Sugar, Sunda, Potunga, we, uh, Fox among Nebu Paul.
抓起来，喂，你好，你是谁？带回来，我是郭德纲。跑回去，我也是郭德纲。这不是废话吗 ？This is Chinese cross talk or xiang xiang. It's the nation's most popular form of live comedy, and you can see it every year on Chinese TV's premier event, the Spring Festival Gala. It all started in 1983 when the first gala was hosted by CCTV. But five years later, in 1988, there was an unfamiliar face, a Westerner presenting Xiang Xiang in Chinese. Kuei Koryo from Yugoslavia was non-Chinese student of Chinese cross-talk master Ding Guangchuan. Since then, Ding has gained a reputation for teaching foreigners the art of Chinese cross-talk. More than 300 students from over 80 countries. In an early interview, Ding said he was trying to show the real China to the world. In the past, people from other countries tended to think Chinese are serious and cold. By introducing Xiangxing abroad, I'm trying to make them know that China is also a nation with humor. His most famous student is Mark Roswell, known as Dashan. His comedy stylings have made him one of the most famous foreigners in China. He even had the honor of being the first non-Chinese to perform a crosstalk with Master Ding himself. Dashan, you don't know. Ah, now my English, ah, can you say that? The daily life of the everyday use of the English language for me is not a problem. Just, just learn one sentence. Ding really gets to know his students, and many of them consider him as much a friend as a father. Ding really gets to know his students, and many of them consider him as much a friend as a teacher. Ding really gets to know his students, and many of them consider him as much a friend as a teacher. Julian Gulfray, now a well-known TV show host, is grateful for this connection. I like Teacher Ding very much. He did so much for me, both in my learning and personal life. Although some Chinese may find the art form dated, it's a whole new world for Western learners. For them, it's a good way of learning Chinese. They think it's both theatrical and colloquial, with a lot of usable idioms and wordplay. This can still be a tricky business. They have to figure out what's really funny for Chinese audiences. A skill you can't really learn from a textbook. But while it may be challenging at first, Chinese style humor is slowly transcending national boundaries and becoming more accessible to a wider audience than ever before. And now with me in the studio are two comedians who are not only foreign fans of Chinese cross talk but also master of it after years of studying, living, and working. In China, first of all, may I introduce Mr. Julian Gaulois? Is that pronunciation correct? It's absolutely well. My my family name was perfect. All、so、right. Sounded like a French. All right then.、Uh, he is a musician and a TV and radio show host here in China. Welcome. Well, thank you for having me here. It's great to have you, and also Mr. David Moser, a、mm -hmm. professor at Capital Normal University here in Beijing. He's bringing hundreds and thousands of American students to China and study here every year. Yeah, I'm sure, but I don't do、uh, stand-up comedy in the classroom. <laughs> They don't think I'm very funny. No, but I have to tell you that he's a very good musician. He's a jazz pianist. In fact, he is a keyboard player.、Mm -hmm. We introduced at the very beginning of our show.、That's、yes,、true. but I'm not funny anymore. So go ahead. <laughs> Talking about funny or not funny, stereotypes have it that the Chinese are always hilariously serious. Oh, that, that's, a, that's a good concept. <laughs> well, it works. Yeah, yeah. It makes people laugh too, right? Yeah. Yeah, I think that the Chinese have a great sense of humor. I don't know why、hmm. people say that. I think the Chinese. I think I think one of the reasons is that the Chinese have.、Uh, I think they have a great sense of humor, but they they also have a great sense of politeness and yeah, face. Yes. And so they they are only they only permit themselves to be humorous in certain situations. Exactly, this is what I wanted to say: is that in everyday life you're going to feel,、uh, and Chinese people love to have a laugh at everything. For that, I think a lot of、uh, cultures are like this.、Mm. But in China, you have a, a very precise notion of things you can say in everyday life, but you won't say in front of someone who's a special person、right. or somebody you've never met, or if it's this type of stage or a TV station. When、uh, you become such a You will give such an abstract concept. You have to give an example.、Uh, well, I can、uh, give an example. Okay, give, give one. Give one. The other day, you know, I with some people, some some teachers, some some grade school teachers, and you know, mostly women, but they're about maybe forty, fifty years old. And they asked me a question. They said,、uh, "So you only have one child, right? You just have one daughter." And I said, "Well, yes, as far as I know." <laughs> and 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 the, and they didn't laugh.、Uh, they sort of went. 
what? What do you mean? As far as you know, I mean that's. And, and then one of them said, "Oh, he's making a joke. Like he might have some other." It's, okay. it's, it's sometimes a conflict of generation. Yeah, you need also. to have a cultural interpreter. Yeah, sometimes it's just, it's just, I think this is not the kind of joke that someone would have made in that situation. In that that's situation, the that's, that's the thing. The and and maybe with younger people who are more used to have fun at everything, maybe it would uh, go better. But what what I meant too is that some jokes, let's say we are very, uh, we know each other very well, and and we're gonna, you know go at it for you know i'm gonna yeah. make fun make of you as, and there's some form of sarcasm that i wouldn't say on a stage or a tv show because mm. then the audience thinks that he's laughing but he's actually feeling very embarrassed and that uh, julian you shouldn't be saying anything like that you make yeah and he's actually not embarrassed but and you're people talking are about modern like, china obviously this right. little no, no, but, the, the but, china we but know. both of you have learned xiangsheng yes mm -hmm. so actually the chinese humor has been going through quite some history so what's this the kind of humor presented in the Chinese Xiangsheng. You've been learning that for 20 years almost, mm -hmm. some of you. Yeah. What is it like, the Chinese humor inside the Chinese Xiangsheng? Uh, David? Uh, well, you have to sort of make a separation because there's traditional Xiangsheng that was uh, before 1949, going maybe from the Qing Dynasty yes. through the 20th century. And those are these traditional pieces that had that were performed in the tea houses and everything. Mm. Then after 1949 and then up to the 1980s, it became a different kind of form because it, because of TV. Xiangsheng is still a very very distant thing. It is distant already in Chinese history. So maybe David, I know you've been doing yeah. a doctor's thesis about uh, specifically Xiangsheng. Master thesis. Master thesis. What exactly is it about? Well, Xiangsheng was originally. Uh, it, it's, it's going to take too long to explain it all, but it was basically a kind of street theater, a, a dialogue between two people, um, and it was meant to to be sort of very much uh, pop, a popular form that talked about you know lo problem daily life problems and stuff like that. And uh, I think the, the the thing Western audiences might be most familiar with is the Abbott and Costello routine that you mentioned. The, mm -hmm. who, who's on first? It's a kind of a set routine. That, that involves uh, you know a certain kind of set of jokes, and m most people are familiar with it. These are the traditional pieces, mm -hmm. yeah. and uh, those would kind of reflect the older China. And so, but a lot of the humor could be very body and sort of uh, mm, uh, risque, even, and, and and it was very earthy. Let's put yes. it that way. They, I, I think even after forty nine, they dared to make fun of more of society problems than they used uh, to before. And uh, before 49, it was more, you know, going at each other. You yeah. know, I make fun of you, you right. make fun of me. Or even there was this old routine that it's always the token who makes fun of the punk and who's the one who's uh, talking less and doing, mm, oh, okay, or asking questions. There's a funny man and a straight man. Right? And mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and, uh, it, I think now it's, it's also totally uh, a different story now because people have more influences. But uh, to answer your question differently, uh, with Xiangsheng, it's usually on stage and for many people. So you, you do a type of humor that is not really humor. That is a way to make people laugh. And you use techniques that are different than saying a funny thing in everyday life. Do you still remember the first piece of Xiangsheng you learned? And wow. how funny was it? Can you explain to our viewers maybe just a very small short paragraph of it that where the yeah. joke comes I can, from. I can remember one of the first ones. I think the first one. Next is you, uh, Julian. Um, <laughs> it, it was, it's a traditional piece called the uh, Zhang Xiaozui. And the, the point being that the Chinese traditional female beauty, there's supposed to be this small cherry lip mouth, you That's know, but right. some women who have big mouths and big <laughs> lips and big <laughs> lips, they feel like they're ugly. And so, so the, the joke is that, that he said he knew this woman in order to make her mouth look beautiful. Whatever you ask her, she would not answer in a, using words that would open your mouth wide, okay. right? So if, if, if you ask her how old she was, she wouldn't say, I'm 28. She'd say, I'm 22, you know, yeah. that kind of thing. <laughs> Even the content changed. Right. So, so that was the joke. And so I did this joke, but I added something, and I did this at Peking University with one of my professors, and uh, I brought along some lipstick, and I put on some lipstick, but, which is but, not but the just part yeah, of just your mouth, little, it's just uh, the middle of it, lip, yes. <laughs> and I did this, and the crowd just fell on the floor laughing because they'd never seen a performer do this, you know, put the lipstick so on. So the funny part wasn't actually what you, what you were saying, it was the lipstick. It was partly part the lipstick. Yeah. Right. You were, you were, uh, but, but that's an example of a traditional piece 
you just get the idea and, and, you, and you can play it out as long as you want. Mm. And, That's also a free social phenomenon, yeah, which the right. piece have been playing with. And what about you, Julian, the well, first piece? I, I, was not, I was not as lucky or as good as, as you the first time. I remember <clears throat> I memorized for a show, uh, it was after I met Mr. Ding, and um, I was actually still with living in With your shifu. Yeah, 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 yeah who our, was teacher, our teacher. Yeah. Um, teacher Ding, Ding, Lao, Ding Guangquan. Yeah, Ding Guangquan Lao Shi. And, and I was still living in Shanghai back then. He introduced me to a show uh, that was... Um, that I would be hosting with a, a Chinese female host for a, a competition for foreigners talking Chinese. So like I would host the thing, and they wanted me to perform something. So they, you know, right. they asked me. To and your piece said, is the piece. I had I, I memorized two pieces. One was the Bao Chai Ming. You know, just a word the tongue. What, how do you say the tongue? Well, it's like a tongue twister yeah, of all the dishes' names. Yeah, or Zheng Yang Gao, Zheng Xiong Zhang Zheng Lu, also Hua Ya Shou Tu, the Lu Du Lu Ya Jiang Ji La Rou, Song Hua Xiang Zhi Ya Rou, Xiang Tang, Shi Zhi Yi Ping Zhi. Yeah. Yeah, I, I could do the whole These thing. These are like right. the basic skills you guys need to learn, right? Basic right, skills. Right, right. And, well, I memorized it. And then there was a Danko Xiangsheng, which was a real story. It was a one-person form. Mm -hmm. One-person form. Monologue. And you tell a story, and you're supposed to make people laugh every two sentences or one sentence. And at the rehearsal, I did it for TV. And the, 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 mm -hmm. the word uh, twister went perfectly. And they, everyone was clapping. It was great. And when I was telling the story that lasted for 10 minutes, no one laughed. Really, no. Wow. Just, oh, no, one old lady was there. To, <laughs> but she was probably amazed at my Chinese. Did you invite than, her for dinner? I should have. Yeah. I should have. How uh, did you react when nobody laughed? Well, you're embarrassed. But you don't have uh, much experience, so you don't know what to think. Or, uh, I, I didn't really overanalyze that. But I understood Mr. Ding was laughing and said, well, you see, you speak good. Because uh, people were thinking, all oh, those foreigners, they just speak Chinese and go on stage and uh, and people think it's funny. And actually, I learned that all the other foreigners, I thought, only had to go on stage and right. be funny. It was actually also a skill. <laughs> Humor has a lot to do with perceptions and linguistic skills. So I really wonder, through this process of learning Chinese xiangsheng or crosstalk, what kind of new perceptions have you learned about this country or this culture and new linguistic skills that's really colloquial that would really help you to be street smart here in China? Yeah, well, you know, I've, I've actually made some, some crosstalk uh, teaching materials to help people learn Chinese. And, and your other guest on the show, Da Shan, you know, Mark is a good example. Someone Mark going who, to be with us later yeah, in the he's, program. He's someone who, whose Chinese got as good as it, as it is, partly from doing Xiangsheng a lot, right? But I think it, it it makes you very aware of of the sort of uh, the sort of important parts of the language, such as pronunciation. You're very uh, clear about uh, you know standard Mandarin, Putonghua. It also has a lot to do with with accents, regional accents, regional dialects. There's also a lot of idioms and a lot of things called the xie mm -hmm. yu, which is this traditional uh, allegorical two part saying in Beijing dialect. So it's it's great. It, Xiangsheng is a form that's, uh, that's very obsessed with language and linguistics. And, and almost, almost every piece has something that, that calls attention to the audience to the linguistic aspect of what they're saying. And mm. there are lots of, there's a lot of, uh, of knowledge in there. You have to, to memorize texts of, uh, of history, for example, when you do that. Right. This is a great thing uh, with Xiangsheng is that you can learn a lot with, uh, about Chinese culture. You memorize also the false timing, and then you know the, the names of 200 dishes just mm -hmm. like that by memorizing for, for, for one week. But you guys uh, also been embedded with the Xiangsheng circle, shall I say that, because your teacher is Mr. Ding Wang Chuan, and he's well known for bringing in these international students yes. and learn this Chinese traditional cultural format. Uh, but at the same time, you got to know many of those people inside the Xiangsheng circle. And these people are supposed to be quite grassroots and also street smart mm -hmm. yes. and very colloquial when it comes to language and the way they're doing things. But so what is that aspect of China that you've seen? How would you describe it? Were you taken by surprise or actually it's a beautiful, nice surprise? No, I think it's a good thing. I'm, 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 <laughs> there's also a danger here because there, there are lots of those foreigners and because we are, we were, uh, kind of a phenomenon, really, the foreigners who would speak Chinese and, and make Chinese people laugh and do Xiangsheng. But some of uh, us went a little too far by trying to sound too Beijing or trying to sound too Xiangsheng and using words that typically, typically uh, you don't hear in everyday life and you only hear in Xiangsheng uh, or a way of saying them, you know, with a typical Xiangsheng tone. Or, or, so this is a dangerous part, too. And so the on-state stuff has become off-state and it becomes such a little bit 
yes. too much. You, 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 you become part of, but it's like, sing, you know, opera singers who, <laughs> who speak like that all the time. Right. So some people just have that. It's so, um, but I, you know, you, mean, you asked about the performers. And, um, you know, one thing that's, that's interesting is that uh, they're, they're, it's a traditional art form. And it has its standard, you know, uh, skills and routines and things like that. I think that there's one problem with the traditional performers that they sometimes get very conservative in the way they do it. And, and they, they feel like, oh, this is, you can't add this kind of new element because that wouldn't be the traditional piece. Or that wouldn't be the traditional crosstalk piece. And so uh, the reason that uh, Ding Wang Chan, our teacher, is so special is that he's someone who could take foreigners because he said, the tradition doesn't matter so much. Let's just try something new. Let's just do something <laughs> totally different. A lot of the other traditional performers, uh-huh. they're very good at what they do, but, but they're also very conservative about their art form. Let's and they wouldn't forget. let you make a mistake or let you try out. Let's You're actually forget. quite fortunate to have Mr. Yes, Dean. Right, yeah, right. Let's not forget that the traditions we're trying to prepare or to, to, to imitate come from people who actually were innovators at the time. Yeah, they were not. As with all traditions, mm-hmm. once it becomes set, then that becomes, if you, if you want to make it a museum piece, that's deadly. And times have changed. They wouldn't want us to, to do the right. way they did. And this is one thing I wanted to say earlier, is that what, there's one great thing with studying any form of comedy, you know, not only Xiangsheng, is that you have to make people from another culture laugh. So you have to learn more about their, their culture. And this is a great thing. You have to know how to speak or how to say something. Mm-hmm. And you learn skills also to Here, tell, even tell a joke on a... On a here's on the a... thing. I think one interesting phenomenon about the so-called foreigner speaking Chinese Xiangsheng or doing Chinese Xiangsheng <laughs> is whether they themselves have become, quote unquote, the joke or actually the joke that they are telling about have become the humorous part to the audience. There's a huge difference between these two. And it has a lot to do with the perceptions of Chinese as time goes by. David, what do you think? Which part of it and which part would you prefer? It's, a, it's such a special thing to have this foreigner there. You can't just pretend that it's an ordinary piece and just do it in the traditional way. You've got to do something. And, you know, and one of the things is you have to let the foreigner be the one who does the most talking. Otherwise, it doesn't really make much mm-hmm. sense, right? So I, I think that there was... You know, Julian can can agree with this or disagree, but I think there was there was a stage at which that the only joke, the only point was that it was a foreigner doing it. It didn't even matter what you said or how yeah. well you did it. It was just the novelty. You would Have think we gone humor. through that yeah. period? Yeah. Have we gone through that period? Yes, already? I was going to say I think we've gone to another stage now, and it's no longer just uh, just uh, to, to see the foreigner up there as that it's a novelty act. You now have to actually do something that's actually artistic or actually groundbreaking or interesting otherwise it's not funny. there are two aspects here uh the first one is as you're saying are, are we actually telling the joke uh, or are we the joke but the result is the same that people laughed then it's about analyzing why did people laugh and mm-hmm. and, and you all have that those recollections where do you, you care as comedian well we have to care but at the same time the result is always the best and, and you can always <laughs> pretend that it was a second degree uh, but 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 there's there's one other aspect i i, I watch a lot of uh, of uh, Western comedy as well, yeah. French and American. I remember one black comedian American saying, you know, you always have to remember who you are, which meant the perception others have of, of you. you. And look at American comedy still. I mean, it's a big melting pot, maybe the, the, the biggest in the world, but mm. still most black comedians, they make black humor, right? Most Jewish comedian make Jewish humor. Most uh, Arab comedian, uh, they, they, they do, you know, everyone goes with, with their his, own niche. The, yeah, and or Indian you know, guys like Russell Peters, right. they always have fun. Are you, with that, are, you so. are you satisfied with that kind of description? You have to have your own niche, and maybe it's a very small niche. Well, I agree with what he's saying in that there is an audience stereotype, and you've got to at least acknowledge it. You've got to yeah. either go with it, you know, play along with it, or violate it. But you you, you can't deny that there is the stereotype, and that's right. our problem too. As and soon as we're up there on the stage, they say, "Oh, a foreigner." You cannot deny it because this is the, perce- the real perception of people. And if you want to make them laugh, you have to accept what right. they see in you. And, right. and this is why when Joe Wong went on stage and says, well, I'm Irish, all people were laughing. All right. And final <laughs> question before we go. I think the times are running past very fast. People talk about the future of Xiangsheng or Chinese cross talk. There's always debate about the old and the new. Where is the future? Can anyone like you in this niche play a role for its future? David? I think... The crosstalk has to evolve. It has changed. There's so much competition now, mm. and unless the, I think the problem is in the performers have to have some, you know, some new ideas, and people are going into stand-up comedy, which you're going to talk about, I know, and uh, and I think that that's that's the main thing. The, the future, if anything, for Xiangsheng has to 
to, it has to adapt and, and you know, do something new. I had this big, right. big discussion with Mr. Ding, and he was saying that Xiangsheng he's more traditional. And, and I was saying, you know, for me, it has to adapt and it has to be comedy. He said, yes, but comedy is comedy, Xiangsheng is Xiangsheng. So Xiangsheng, yeah. it's, it's different views. Right. right. And, but Mr. Ding had a very nice point about this. Is there were maybe uh, in the 50s and 60s and then in the 80s, Xiangsheng was too famous, too big a thing. So it's not that it's in decline, but it was too much at those times. Mm -hmm. And now right. it's come back to normal and we have too much media and other choices to make. I can tell you are a good student of Mr. Ding, but at the same <laughs> time, certainly wonderful learners of Chinese culture. And we are benefiting from your style of Xiangsheng. Well, in order to understand better about our own culture. Thank you so much for being with us and Happy New Year. You to too. The two of you and your beloved ones, Julian and also David. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. So uh, that's basically today's show. And thank you for joining me today. Guess I'll see you next time.